Finding faith on the earth here today. Great to see you guys um, following Jesus through a, a tremendous study in the book of Luke right now. So go ahead and turn there in your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Look, I'm not having any technical problems. Isn't that cool? I just jinxed myself. For a All right. Well, so let's go ahead and read this first, and you'll get a flavor for what Jesus is talking about. We may not read the whole thing. We'll just uh, get to a certain point. But uh, he says there in chapter 18, verse 1, Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought, always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, This was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me. From my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust <coughs> judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will, uh, will he really find faith on the earth. And we're going to stop right there. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word here this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to come once again and study it and, and just be washed by it, be cleansed and, and be uh, set upon a firm foundation once again. And uh, Lord, today that you would help us to understand it by your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would come now upon every heart in this room and just convict and uh, encourage and rebuke and whatever needs to be done in our hearts. Lord, we freely offer ourselves to you for that and we appreciate it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, again, finding faith on the earth, you see uh, right there in that verse, that last verse that we read where Jesus is talking about that. And that should um, remind you of something that we've been looking at in, in the last chapter, chapter 17, the, really the last half of that chapter. Jesus was talking about his return when the Son of Man comes. And uh, the Pharisees had asked him, hey, you keep talking about this kingdom of God. When's it going to happen? When are you coming? Or when are you going to establish this kingdom you keep talking about? And uh, Jesus told them, uh, it's really the kingdom of God is in your heart and you haven't received it yet. But then he goes on to tell his disciples in more detail about what it's going to look like when he does return. Uh, when he comes back a second time and he tells them it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be violence. It's going to be, uh, you know, not, people really not believing in God at all, except for a small number of people. It's going to be, it's going to be just like the days of Lot, uh, where sexual immorality is just rampant. And, of course, we know that uh, we're living in those kind of days right now, aren't we? And so uh, when Jesus comes to this place about talking about faith once again, two Sundays ago, uh, we talked about, you know, three separate vignettes about faith, and now he's back on that once again. Uh, three more times he's going to reference the idea of faith and what faith really looks like, what real faith looks like. And, and so finding faith on the earth. Well, he says there, and this is the amplified version of the Bible, in the brackets there, you see, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith, real faith. Real faith that isn't wishy-washy. Real faith that isn't uh, just kind of a, I'll pray one time, if God doesn't answer my prayer, oh, I guess he doesn't exist, you know, kind of thing. Uh, real prayer, or real faith that's humble. It's not arrogant. It's not in your face. It's simple. It's like a childlike faith, is what Jesus will get into today. And so we'll look at that. But again, this, uh, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I've tried to really uh, break it to you gently uh, in the last couple of years that, uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be a, a return to some kind of a Garden of Eden type existence here on the earth before the Lord returns. I think it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And these passages kind of lead, lead us to that understanding that uh, there's not going to be many faithful left upon the earth when Jesus returns. 
there won't be a, a large number of people. Uh, the Bible talks about a remnant of people that remain faithful to the Lord while every, but everyone else becomes apostate. And uh, we know that the apostasy of the church is one of the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this, I, I thought um, we should look at what Keith Green said back in the 1970s. In one of his songs, he wrote, Glory, Lord Jesus, glory to your holy name. Glory, Lord Jesus, your blood has removed my shame. But then look what he says. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Well, I hope so. I want to be found ready. And I think that's a great uh, application for us here in our study today. As Jesus tells us, here's what faith looks like. Faith is persistent. It doesn't just give up after praying one time. It keeps going. And uh, the perseverance of the saints is really one of the things that lets you know you really truly are saved. Is you don't give up. You, you keep on going. Now you can stumble and you can falter and you can lose faith maybe in a temporary sense. But eventually you always come back because that faith is within you. It keeps on going. It perseveres within your life. And so we'll look at that. Persistent faith. We'll look at humble faith. As Jesus will reference, you know, these two guys go to the temple. You've got the Pharisee over here. You've got the uh, tax collector over here. The Pharisee's praising himself about how great he is and how self-righteous he is. The tax collector over here can't even raise his eyes to heaven. He's, he's so broken and, and realizes how lost he is. And he prays to God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, that's the one that's going to be justified when he goes home today. Not this Pharisee over here who's praying to himself, essentially. And so humble faith is another thing that faith looks like. And then simple faith, as Jesus will bring a child to himself. The, the uh, disciples are keeping the kids away from Jesus. Hey, Jesus doesn't have time for these little kids. Get them away. Keep them away. And Jesus says, no, bring them to me, for such is the kingdom of God. These simple ones who come with this simple faith, that's what true faith really looks like. And so it's a great um, thing for us today, living in the times that we are living in. How are we going to deal with a world that is getting increasingly hostile towards you and your faith? And you know that's true. I don't have to go into any great details. I don't have to show you any graphics on the screen to let you know that less people are going to church. Less people are serious about their Christian faith. Uh, less people are reading their Bibles. Less people are biblically literate. And as a result, the world is, is beginning to spin out of control. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard for us sometimes. We get discouraged. And sometimes we feel like quitting even sometimes. But Jesus says, hang in there. Be persistent in your faith. It's a key to our faith here today. Uh, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Don't give up. Don't fail. Don't become a coward. I looked at the other uh, amplified uh, Bible verse for this one, and it talks about being a coward and just uh, quitting, essentially. You get to a place where, ah, it's just too hard. Too hard to be a Christian. Too hard to walk this walk anymore. I'm just going to give up. Well, that's not true faith. You may have said that you had faith at one time, but again, a Christian perseveres. A, a Christian keeps going. Uh, maybe stumble, stumbles again, you know, has a hard time, and maybe for a period you go through a, a period where you're just too weak to walk the walk, and, but then you always have to come back to that place of repenting and asking God to give you the strength to get back up again and keep on walking out this faith walk that he's called you to. Men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And what a great encouragement for us as he tells this parable, right, about uh, this, this woman who keeps coming to this unjust judge. Hey, get, uh, get justice for me. And he finally does it, but not because he is a just judge, and so God, uh, Jesus is not comparing God to an unjust judge. He's contrasting with this unjust judge. And so we'll look at that. Uh, there was a certain judge 
uh, in a certain, or there was a, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. I, I was listening to a pastor earlier this week, and he said, okay, what's new? <laughs> Isn't that a qualification for judges? Not to fear God and not to, no. No, we shouldn't say that about all judges. I'm sure there's one or two that are okay. But, um, you know, they, they definitely have a, a tendency to uh, get some power-hungry tendencies in their judging sometimes, it seems like. But this guy, certainly, he does not fear God. He does not regard men. And, um, you know, it, it's very similar to what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Keep on asking for the Holy Spirit. Don't just ask one time. And, uh, or don't ask at all because you're fearful of what God might give you. He says kind of the same thing to us in that sense. In Matthew 7, 9, he says, What man is there of you whom, if his son asks uh, bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, see, I'm old King James here. You're tripping me up here, Dave, with this old King James <laughs> stuff. If ye... Then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And so you see that clearly there, it's a contrast between this judge. It's not comparing. He's not saying God's like an unjust judge. Unlike this unjust judge who eventually gives in, the idea is that God is just, and he, of course he will. Yeah, of course he will listen to us. Of course he will avenge. Of course he will do what is needed for his children because he loves his children. And so that's the idea of this comparison here. And many of the parables are like that. Some of them uh, put them side by side a spiritual truth. Others are a contrast of that spiritual truth that's laid down next to it. But it says there, now when this widow, uh, now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me for my, from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. This lady's driving me crazy. <laughs> okay, fine. And, you know, the court system then was very different. Uh, we didn't have a situation, or they didn't have a situation back then like where we do, where you have a docket. Okay, next one up on the docket. Okay, give us your case, and, and the judge will rule on it. It was the judge's prerogative to say, okay, I'll listen to your case now. It was his decision to say uh, which case he was going to try and which case he was not going to, evidently. And, and so that's what's going on here. Uh, he doesn't have any regard for this woman whatsoever. Of course, women uh, in general in that society weren't regarded very highly, uh, unfortunately. But uh, this unjust judge is, is finally giving in, not because it's the right thing to do, but because she's driving him crazy. And so, interesting what happens there. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect, who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Again, it goes back to that verse I read about the Holy Spirit. God is just. Of course he's going to take care of his children. Of course he's going to do it. Shall not God judge his own elect who cry out uh, day and night to him? And uh, of course he's going to. Of course he's going to care for his people. He's going to do the right thing. Now, whether we believe it's the right thing or not, sometimes... Uh, you know, that's the case where we've asked God for something and uh, he doesn't do it the way we want him to do it. And therefore, oh, God's not listening to my prayers. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. He hears your prayers. And uh, mercifully, he's not answered your prayer because he knows that's not what you need right now. It's not his will for your life right now. And, and of course, those things are beyond the scope of, of what we can readily understand. And so in faith, we just have to say, well, I'll just wait. I'll just uh, maybe keep persistently asking, and, uh, and maybe God will answer in time. Because it really does show that we have faith, doesn't it? When we just keep being persistent about our faith. And uh, I, I know that's a very hard thing for most of us as Christians, you know, to keep on praying, to keep on asking. Um, I know there was a time in my own life 
where, I, where I could recognize some kind of persistence. Before we came back here to Colorado, where, which is our home, uh, I was pastoring a church out in California, up in Eureka, California. And um, I would come home because a, an aunt or an uncle had passed away. Or, you know, usually that was the reason we'd come home, is to go to a funeral. And so I got to a point where, you know, we'd been gone for about 25 years, essentially, in the Navy for 20 and 5 years in the ministry. And, uh, and so I, I started realizing my family's dying off. All my aunts and uncles that I grew up with are all dying off. And, and so I'd come home and I'd see my mom and dad and, and they were beginning to show those signs of getting elderly and, and having problems with their health as well. And, and so I just started getting convicted that, you know, I need to come home. I need to get back to Colorado and be around my family and, and take care of my mom and dad when they get to a place where they're going to need me. And, uh, and so, but I didn't do anything about it. I just started praying about it. And for the next year, I just prayed. Not really consistently. Uh, I'm not consistent in anything in my life, and certainly not prayer. But I was trying to be persistent, and I was trying not to take action without just waiting upon the Lord. And uh, it was such a unique situation where uh, the church building that we were in, we either had to, our lease was coming up, and we either had to... Uh, buy the building or sign another rental agreement or lease with them. And so I kept praying and asking the Lord and, and uh, you know, it just kind of got whittled down to one decision and that was to, to sign the lease again for another three years. And so I remember very clearly, I just prayed one more time. I said, okay, Lord, is this what you want me to do? Is this your will for this church? And, and so I began to sign my name to that lease and in the middle of my signature, the Lord spoke to me and said, okay, you're done. You're done. You're, you're free to leave this church now and, and go back to Colorado. And I was shocked. I was just like, whoa. And, and I felt like he said, you know, you've done everything I've called you to do here. And now you're free to go back to Colorado. Because I didn't have that sense before that I was free. But again, because of this persistent prayer, um, I felt like the Lord led me to that place and, and so as soon as I finished signing that lease, I picked up the phone and called Al Pittman over here at Calvary Worship Center. I didn't know him, but uh, a good uh, pastor friend of mine that we had out in, California, in uh, Virginia was a good friend of his. And so I said, look, I, I don't know anybody back there. This is my situation. I don't really want to get out of the ministry, but I really need to get home and take, take care of my family. And uh, he said, well, you know, nothing's going on here. You know, we don't know of any churches that are planting and needing a pastor. And, and so I thought, oh, well, that's discouraging. But we kept talking and kept talking and kept talking. And for about an hour, we talked on the phone. And then at the end of the hour, he said, you know what? I wasn't going to tell you this, but actually, Calvary Chapel North on the north end of town just announced that their pastor's stepping down and they're looking for a new pastor. <laughs> and within a month of that phone call, we were packing up a U-Haul and moving back to Colorado. And, and so, you know, God works that way. It's an amazing thing. But, um, you know, and I'm not trying to brag on my persistence, but I, I think it, it, it does tell you that when we are persistent, it shows that we are serious about being in God's will as opposed to just doing things on our own. And uh, our persistence is an indication that there's a level of faith at work in our lives. And, uh, and that's a good example of that, I think. Okay, so um, we got to get going here. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, he cried out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Will he really find that kind of persistent faith on the earth? Now, you talk about uh, seeker-friendly kind of mentalities within the church, uh, the progressive Christianity that we've talked about quite a bit here, that is this kind of flaky Christianity that really isn't grounded in God's word at all. It's just kind of, oh, we're going with the flow here just to make everybody happy. You know, those kind of things. And, um, you know, I, I think that's the direction the church is headed. It's going down this apostate road 
uh, that is not grounded in truth. It's not grounded in a walk with the Lord. It's not grounded in persistence in prayer. It's not grounded in these types of faith that we're talking about today. Humble faith and persistent faith and simple faith. Uh, it's grounded in church growth programs and, uh, and what's the world doing now and what's popular now and those kind of things. And so uh, by the time Jesus returns, what's, gonna, what's the church going to look like? It, it's a frightening thing. You know, uh, the elders and I and, and the pastors and I have been talking and uh, I, I don't know, I just really have this sense that what God wants us to do is just to encourage other churches like ours. Because we know how discouraging it can be, especially during a, a global pandemic or uh, some other weird thing that's going on in the world where you can't go to church and all that kind of stuff and, and uh, people are flaking out. And, you know, it can be very discouraging to, to try to grow the church in the world that we're living today. Uh, it's discouraging not to see young families wanting to go to church. Uh, if you're visiting here today, you know, you may not know, but we don't have hardly any kids in our Sunday school because young families just uh, aren't going to church as much. And, and so what is the church going to look like? Well, I, I think as we go forward, you know, I think to encourage other believers to just stand firm. To just stand firm on God's word. Stand firm on these principles that the church has been guided by for the last 2,000 years and not give in to other things uh, to try to be more popular, try to grow a church and those kind of things. What kind of church is the Lord going to find when he returns upon the earth? We see other verses that are like this. Um, Matthew 24, of course, that great passage dealing with the end times. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And of course, this is worst case scenario here. This is, I believe, in the actual tribulation period, not the time leading up to it that we're in. But um, I, I think by the time the tribulation gets here, uh, that's the direction we're going right now is what this will end up being. Uh, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax cold. As, as the world gets darker, uh, we do have a tendency to not put ourselves out there as much, right? Not to be as friendly, not to open ourselves up because we don't want to get hurt. We don't want to be um, hurt or made fun of or whatever. And, and so this idea of the, the love of many shall wax cold. Violence is uh, part of the days of Noah. We know we're very violent times and, uh, and hearts are going to turn cold. And so we have to be careful not to be so affected by that that the church changes and, uh, and we become cold as well rather than being the loving church that God has called us to be. And so, um, you know, one person writes here, I think this is John MacArthur, this suggests that when he returns, the true faith will be comparatively rare, as in the days of Noah, when only eight souls were saved. The period before his return will be marked by persecution, apostasy, and unbelief. And I, I think that's very true. That's what the world is going to look like before Jesus returns. And, um, you know, I, I know there is a sense that, hey, I still believe in our city. I still believe in our country and all that stuff. And, and I do, too, in, in one sense. But do you believe more in our country than you do in what God's word says? Because God's word says it's all about to start burning. It's all going to be judged um, because they are turning away from me because they are apostate, because they are going down that road of unbelief, um, this, this country of ours that we love so dearly is headed for a fall. Unless it rapidly uh, repents of its sins and turns around uh, in a huge way. Um, and so as we look at this, uh, I love what Jude says here. Jude 1.21, keep yourselves in the love of God, 
looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's what we need to do as believers. We need to stay in that place of steadfast faith in Jesus Christ and uh, keep looking to him, the author and the finisher of our faith. But look what it also says. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know, it really is a different view than the idea that we're going to turn things around and save our nation or save the world as an as a institution or as a, a government system or anything like that. When you look at this idea of we're on the outside, we've been pulled out of that fire, and now our job is with fear of getting sucked back into that world system Go down and pull people out of that fire. The, the building is burning. The building is burning to the ground. We're not going to be able to save it. That's my opinion. And I think it's based in scripture. That this world is on fire and we're not going to be able to save it as a, a world system. But we can save those people that are in that fire. And so with fear, we have to be the church that says we need to go rescue people. We need to go save people. We need to go, like if, if a building was on fire and we had an opportunity to go into that building while it's on fire and rescue somebody, rescue a, a child. I had a, a grandmother who uh, was at our house when our house burned down when I was a little kid. And uh, she got confused and thought the kids were all at the house. And so she went back into one of the back bedrooms and tried to find the kids and get them out of the house. and and was overcome by the smoke and ended up hiding in the closet and that's where the fireman found her. Is she was hiding in the closet and she'd been burned on her arms and suffered a lot of smoke inhalation damage and that kind of stuff, but uh, she was pulled out of that fire. She was rescued. She lived for like another 20 years after that. She was a tough, tough lady. But, um, you know, it's the idea that, yeah, we hate the world system. We hate the sin. We hate what we see on the TV every night. We hate the direction our country is going, but we have to love those people enough to say, I'm going to go into that fire and I'm going to pull somebody out of there and save them for eternity because that's what God has called us to do. And so that's what we have to be about, the saving of people, not the saving of places. And so moving on there now to humble faith. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And so, obviously, he's talking about the Pharisees here, and he tells this parable about uh, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. <laughs> Prayed with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. It, and you have to look how many times he says the word I here. It'll tell you something. I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing that, you know, you see just how he's justifying himself even in his words. We know that's what the, the typical pharisaical thing is, to justify yourself in your own self-righteous way rather than let God justify you, rather than let God convict you of your sin and then repent of that sin and then be justified by God. The pharisaical route is to try to justify myself, pray with myself, come up with a bunch of rules that I can keep so therefore I can look righteous in front of everybody else. And interesting what uh, Charles Kettering said. He was a, a major engineer for uh, General Motors back in the day when they were trying to develop the vehicles and the cars back when they first start going. But um, he said, when I was research head of General Motors and wanted a problem solved, I'd place a table outside the meeting room with a sign, leave slide rules here. <laughs> messed that up, sorry. Um, if I didn't do that, I'd find someone reaching for his slide rule, then he'd be on his feet saying, boss, you can't do it. And the whole idea was, you know, people were, 
rather than trying to figure out the problem and trying to solve the problem and come together and, and, and figure out the right way of doing it, people would just get that slide rule out and, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. So there's very little faith in what was beyond their own control in their own slide rule. And a lot of times that happens within the church, you know. Uh, I've had in the past, we don't have now, praise the Lord, uh, I've had people on our board that were just like that, you know. Well, let me take out my calculator and see. Can we afford that? No, we can't afford that. Okay, but think in the faith dimension. <laughs> if God wants us to do that, if God is guiding us to do that, he will provide for us to do that. No, 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 my calculator right here, it says we, we don't have enough money to do that. And, uh, and a lot of times you, uh, in a church, you, you are bound by just what people think we can do. What, think, what, what they think we can accomplish, rather than having this faith that moves mountains, this faith that rips up a mulberry tree out of the ground and throws it in the ocean that Jesus talks about, we are bound by our own uh, reasoning, by our own thoughts, by our own abilities to figure things out, rather than having faith in a God that created the entire universe and has all of the power and all the money and <coughs> anything that we need, Rather than trust in him and have faith in him, we have faith in our own systems that we've come up with and our own abilities to reason these things out. And so faith, it's a, it's a dynamic thing that you see here, this humble faith. He goes on, this Pharisee, he says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, this goes all the way back to when we began the book of Luke, for those of you who've been brave enough to be here with us for that time. But uh, you remember the first time that Jesus ever stood up and spoke in a synagogue, he said, you know, here I'm here, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach to the poor. And then we look at it, and Matthew, it's the poor in spirit. Those who realize that they truly are in need of salvation. Those who are humble enough to come to a place of recognizing that I am a sinner in need of salvation. I have broken God's laws. I am not righteous. I am not um, able to stand in his presence because I have broken his standards. And I, I need to ask for forgiveness of that and ask him to uh, pour out his grace and mercy upon me. So the person who comes to that place is the one that God is pleased with and the one that God will pour out his grace upon and the one he will justify. And of course, you know, we in the, in the New Testament understand what the word justification means. Um, I think he goes on here. He says, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so the idea of justifying is you're just or righteous before God, in God's eyes. And for the people standing around listening to what Jesus is saying, their jaws must have just hit the ground. As they just said, Jesus just said that a tax collector who is the most hated, sinful person in their entire society is going to be justified in God's sight before the people we consider the most righteous people to be justified. And I mean, they must have just, what? What are you talking about? And it's not because that tax collector was a righteous person. It's because they recognized they needed the righteousness of God to cleanse them. He, he recognized that he was a horrible sinner. And he repented of that sin and cried out for mercy to God. And that is the person who is justified in God's sight, not the one who is self-righteous and uh, exalts himself. And I think, you know, um, that last part of that verse there, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Sometimes that doesn't happen in the times that we're living in, does it? Seems like some people are just arrogant and prideful and they just get away with murder all the time and, and uh, everything seems to go well for them. Sometimes they fall. You know, the Bible does say uh, pride goes before the fall and, and certainly they do fall. 
we were watching documentary the other day about uh, Michael J. Fox and you know how high and exalted he was back in the Back to the Future days, you know, and just where he's at now. And not because, you know, of making fun of him because he has, you know, this illness that he has now, uh, but just how the mighty fall. They do eventually come down to earth. Um, but ultimately, as we stand before God, as we stand before God, as we've exalted ourselves upon this earth and feel like we're good enough to get into heaven, and then we have to stand before God and be humbled to, to realize we're not getting into heaven. We're not justified before God. Rather, we should, as this tax collector, recognize our sinfulness, confess it to the Lord, because he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so that is the key here for us today. Not only to be persistent in our faith, but to be humble, to be broken, to recognize where we are in God's eyes and to ask for forgiveness and to keep short accounts with him and to allow him to convict us by his Holy Spirit, allow him to guide us and direct us in our lives so that we have a humble, penitent heart at all times. Now, as we move on there, I love this verse, uh, James 4, 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And uh, that's uh, been one of my life verse. Uh, I love that one, not because I'm a humble guy, but uh, I want to be. And uh, recognizing that God does resist us when we're prideful. God does uh, give us the hand. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that, you know, talk to the hand. But um, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And so what an encouragement for us to just have that humble heart, that penitent heart. Uh, as we kind of get into the next phase, this idea of simple faith, I wanted to talk briefly just about this idea of evolution and the man-made theories that are out there. Because, you know, you might be sitting here today thinking, well, I don't believe in God because, you know, I just, uh, I have a rational mind. You know, you hear people say that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm intelligent. I, I've been to school and, you know, I, I know that uh, God can't just do this and do that like it says in the Bible. And uh, the world was really created by these naturalistic processes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I think about the arrogance of that kind of a statement. The arrogance and, and uh, you know, it can't be just this simple faith thing. You know, it needs to be more complex uh, scientific theories and those kind of things. And I think about how God must just shake his head at people that say that kind of stuff. I mean, God, to create the universe, to speak light into existence, to create things by speaking them into existence, the level of sophistication of his intellectual knowledge is, it, it must be just absolutely staggering. I mean, if he explained to us how he did it, we couldn't understand it. You know, if he wrote it all out for us, we'd be like, whoa. You know, one of those big chalkboards you see in a chemistry classroom or something, all the quotations and annotations and all that stuff. I mean, if he really went to lengths to try to help us understand it, we would not be able to understand it. And, and so I, I think it's just God's way of saying, just simply accept it, like a little child. Just simply accept what I have said in my word. And that goes a long way in God's eyes when we just come as a child and just simply say, I just believe. I don't know all the answers. I don't know the ins and the outs. I don't know how he did that stuff in the Old Testament. I don't know how Jesus performed those miracles. I just believe it because God said it. And he's spoken to my life. He's changed my life so much. I just believe it. And I'm not going to question him because he has a vast intellectual knowledge that I could never even fathom. And so why try? Now, it's fun to try to see what we see in the world and understand how the world is made and compare that with what the Bible says and, and justify our faith and all those kind of things. We've been doing that on Wednesday night with the uh, worldview study, and, that, and that's all good. But we can only take that to a certain level. We can't plumb the depths of God's knowledge. In this time frame that we're living in, we just can't get there from here. 
and we never will. But to come to him simply and just as a little child and just say, I just believe. And that's how kids do. It's why we see such an attack on our children today. Because they recognize if we can get those little kids to believe in these crazy theories of evolution and Big Bang and, and all the rest at a little impressionable age, they'll be hooked. They'll be stuck believing that for the rest of their lives. If we can get them to believe that it's okay to transition from being a boy to a girl at these little impressionable ages, they'll believe us. If we just tell them this is the way it's supposed to be, because children just believe, don't they? They just simply believe what they're told. Oh, boy, the hell's not hot enough for people that destroy children's lives like that. It's awful what they're doing to our kids now. But simple faith. Then they also brought infants to him or children to him that he might touch them, just lay his hands on them and bless them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them, the parents, but Jesus called them to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And uh, what a beautiful statement. These little children right here, this is what the kingdom of God is like. People who come to me in simple faith as a child and just believe what I tell them. And persistently keep coming after me, wanting more Humbly coming to me, not with a prideful, haughty spirit, but just a, a penitent heart, uh, asking for forgiveness and coming and, and just believing what I've told them in my word. This is what the kingdom of God is looking like for us. Again, Matthew 18, uh, a more expanded kind of view of, of Jesus' understanding of these children. And he says there at the same time, uh, came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Become like a child. Become like a child. Think more like a child when it comes to our faith. Think more simplistically about God in his word, and uh, therefore you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Who, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom. And of course, you know, the, the disciples were always jockeying for that position, right? Uh, James and John, their mom goes, hey, you know, when you come into your kingdom, you ought to put my boys on your staff over here, you know, <laughs> trying to get them that place of, of authority in the kingdom ahead of time. And uh, Jesus says, hey, you know who the greatest in the kingdom is? That simple-hearted believer who just believes what I tell him and goes out and does it. That's the greatest in the kingdom right there. And so it's a great encouragement for us here today. And so the wrap up with the last final verse here, assuredly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And that's a, a staggering verse right there. I mean, obviously the, the church age hasn't been completely established and we don't understand that in, in the light of the, the, the formula that we kind of come up with, just faith in God, repent of our sins, ask for forgiveness, you know, all those things. But, um, you know, it is a, a great indication of what our faith should be like. Yes, faith is what saves us. And God's grace, because we have faith in him. But what kind of faith is that? Is it a wimpy faith that just kind of, uh, he's not answering my prayers. I guess I'm just not going to pray anymore. Is it a cowardly faith? Or is it a persistent faith? Is it a humble faith? Is it a simple faith like we see here in this passage? Uh, I think uh, Martin Luther said this, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything and whoever does not have faith will have nothing. And that is the key right there. You know, in the final um, scene that we have in the book of Revelation, 
Those who had these, this kind of faith that we've been talking about will be the ones that Jesus says, welcome, good and faithful servant, come on in. Enter into your rest. And those who do not have that kind of simple faith, that kind of persistent faith, that kind of humble faith, will be told, depart from me, I never knew you. And that is a staggering thing for us. Those who have faith will have everything for eternity. Those who do not have faith will have nothing for eternity. And so um, keep that in mind as you go through your week. The kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. Persistent faith, humble faith, simple faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word here today. We thank you for this opportunity to come and just be washed by your word. And Lord, we do ask that uh, you would just help us to meditate upon these things. Help us not to forget them. Help us not to just toss them aside. But Lord, take them with us as we go through our week and analyze, Lord, what kind of faith we truly have. Is it a faith that needs to be shored up a little bit and be more persistent and more humble, more simple? Father, you convict us as needed so that we have the kind of faith that pleases you. We praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.